right now. Also, with that being said, in this first session, we have six student presenters, all from the nursing department. I will introduce each presenter and read the title of their presentation. So presenters, remember, when I am introducing you, you need to share your screen. You will have five minutes to present your work and then an additional two minutes for any questions or comments. If you have questions or comments, please place them in the chat room and Ms. Harold will control those and then read them at the end of each presentation. If needed, I will also give you a one minute warning. Judges, I will also be providing you with a participant ID number. This ID number needs to go at the top of your judging form. All attendees are muted throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions, remember it needs to go into the chat room. And presenters, before you get ready to present, remember to unmute yourself. However, if you forget, we will make sure that you are unmuted. So let's get started. Our very first presenter today is Merrick Bowman. So judges, please note that the participant ID number for the top of your form for Merrick is number 10. Merrick is presenting her work entitled, what are ways to present or what are ways to prevent childhood obesity and incorporate healthy eating? So Merrick, you can begin when you're ready. Can y'all see it? Ma'am. You can? Yes, we can. Okay, hey everyone, I'm Merrick. Um, my presentation is, what are ways to prevent childhood obesity and incorporate healthy eating? A variety of studies were performed to evaluate different ways to prevent obesity in children and incorporate healthy eating. The purpose of finding ways to prevent obesity in children and promote healthy behaviors is to decrease the likelihood of developing comorbidities later in life. A child's health behaviors are greatly influenced by the actions that are practiced in home and school environments. Taking a walk, participating in yoga, or even doing chores around the house can be incorporated into the home environment. Encouraging the school system to make drinking water readily available, make healthy foods and beverages available in the school canteen, and encouraging participation by all students in sports and other physical activities allows for healthier behaviors in the school environment. An author mentions, Mothers are known to have the strongest influence on a child's health behaviors. Mothers who are paid to work usually spend less time at home or with their children. Because of this, mothers have less time to teach their children proper healthy habits to prevent obesity. This results in working mothers' children being at an increased risk for childhood obesity. Results of this study revealed a positive relationship between maternal working hours and mean increase in body mass index and waist circumference. It is vital to reduce the burden placed upon working mother's shoulders who are required to manage both work and childcare. Another study revealed that some mothers are not concerned about their child's weight by suggesting that obesity is a concern for older children or adults. This suggestion by parents puts children at a higher risk for childhood obesity or being overweight. It is extremely significant to stress the importance of shaping children's taste preferences and eating habits from early childhood because many parents perceive their children as largely protected because of their young age. So ways that us as nurses can implement this into our practice is by handing out brochures or teaching a class on healthy food choices and enjoyable physical activity to school-aged children that can further a child's knowledge on healthy, healthy choices and behaviors. Nurses can encourage the school system to incorporate more physical activity and provide healthier food and drink choices for canteen. As nurses, we can develop a plan for mothers to create a budget and set aside time to spend with their children. Nurses can teach mothers ways to incorporate healthy diet choices and physical activity into, into their children's lives. It is important to make sure parents have a good nutritional knowledge and a support system. In order to be effective and have a positive outcome, a basis of knowledge and support is needed. So these are some of the things that you can do for um, healthy choices of food or activities such as water, fruits and vegetables as snacks, playing on the playground at school or if you have a playground outside of your house, riding a bike or jumping rope. And these are my references. 
I chose this topic because from a young age, I always had a really big interest in a healthy lifestyle. And I think that as a nurse, I would really, really enjoy um, talking to mothers on how they can help their children pick healthy choices to prevent comorbidities later in life. And that's it. Oh, Dr. James, I just saw your, um, your comment. I'm a really big, I'm really big into health and fitness. And so this topic really, um, interested me because I implement, I try to implement healthy eating in my lifestyle, which is hard, but from a young age, whenever Um, Alex, the economic status and obesity in children have any correlation? Yes, um, I did do research on one of, one of my topic, I mean, one of my articles was on the poverty, the people that are in poverty do have a more increased risk of obesity, even though they may not have the money to, to eat as much, they do, they don't have a, um, a knowledge background of healthy eating, if that makes sense. But yes, I picked this because I'm a really big, um, I have a really big interest in health and fitness and it's a big part of my life and it's become a big part of my life in the last three years. So that's what I wanted to do this one. Um, what message could you provide to working mothers to help them manage healthy eating for their children? Um, I would say, like I said, creating a budget, I could help mothers create a budget to see how much they spend um, at a grocery store, how many children they have, and we could set aside time for them to, um, to spend time with their children and sit down and talk about healthy eating and maybe if they have access to like different books or say for, for instance like a youtube video on different snack ideas like bringing carrots or celery or strawberries instead of um, candy for lunch it's like whenever i was young this is not very good whenever i was young my mom would pack me chocolate and cookies and um, junk food for lunch and now that I look back, that was not a good idea. And so if I would have known then, then I definitely would have asked her if she could pack me fruit because I still to this day, I have to try to train myself to eat fruit because I, I don't eat fruit or salad. So I have to practice. And so that's one of my big things that I have to overcome. Um, Dr. Dr. Jane, one more question. Do you find this is still a problem that could be an implication for future research for future research? Yes, I do, because there is always going to be an increased um, risk for any children for obesity. And in order for everybody to um, prevent that, you have to have some sort of knowledge background. And I think that everybody should be able to, um, to research that. All right, great job, Merrick. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and mute you back, okay? Oh, you got it. All right. So next... Our next presenter is going to be Monica Abair. So judges, please note that this participant ID's number is number 11. Monica, whoop, I lost my paper here. There we go. Monica's topic that she is presenting on is titled, How Can We Prevent Hospital Acquired Pneumonia? Mm -hmm. So you may begin, Monica. Okay, I'm Monica. Um, my topic is what ways can hospital acquired pneumonia be prevented? I'm having trouble here. So hospital stays are estimated to increase by approximately eight days for patients who acquire hospital acquired pneumonia with a reported mortality rate of 30 to 70%. 
Hospital-acquired pneumonia is most likely to occur in patients who have recently undergone surgery and in those that are mechanically ventilated. The research articles were based on ways to prevent hospital-acquired pneumonia by ventilator-acquired pneumonia bundles, which were referred to as VAP, oral care, and hand washing. So by implementing the VAP bundles, we can elevate the head of the bed uh, 30 to 45 degrees, um, have daily sedation vacation, um, assess their readiness to extubate, septic ulcer disease prophylaxis and deep vein thrombosis pro prophylaxis. And through this study, results demonstrated a reduction in VAP from 21.6 events to 11.6 events per 1,000 ventilator days. There was also a significant decrease in ICU length of stay from 36 to 27 days. And there was also a reduction in duration of mechanical ventilation from 26 to 21 days. Oral protocol. Studies show that within 48 hours of admission, critically ill patients experience changes in oral colonization. 20 million microbes in our mouth replicate every four to six hours and patients microaspirate these microbes. Problems that resulted in the increased HAP was lack of supplies for oral care. Staff weren't aware that the oral care protocol was for all inpatients, not just ventilated patients, and lack of education for nurses to provide effective oral care. So this initiative served to promote oral care by nurses to reduce HAP incidents by 60% and save the hospital more than $2 million the first year. Another one is hand washing. The most common mode of transmission is through contaminated hands. Hand hygiene is just as important for patients and their families as it is, as it is for healthcare workers. Education for thorough hand washing through detailed brochures, visuals, and return demonstration are key in preventing HAP. Through effective hand washing, vancomycin resistant enterococci infections decreased by 70%, and methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus infections decreased by 63%. Relevance to nursing practice VAP bundles are, clear, are a clear evidence based practice that can decrease the incidence of VAP. Physicians and nursing staff can more likely assess critically ill patients and, in turn, recognize the early signs and symptoms of pneumonia by using these bundles. Through many nursing interventions, such as oral care and patient education, we as nurses can prevent HAP. By preventing HAP, we save lives and the hospital millions of dollars. Oral care is a critical component of HAP prevention. Hand washing is essential for everyone. Through education, proper hand hygiene, as well as frequency, can be increased to decrease cases of HAP. And these are my references. Good job, Monica. Thank you. Dr. James would like to know what led you to be interested in this topic? It's such a broad topic and you see a lot of it, um, you know, in clinicals, we saw a lot of it and um, there's never enough research on it on how to prevent it. So it's a never ending battle. What do you think would be the key point to take away from your research? Just prevention through, through all of the things that I stated, plus the, I mean, there's tons of research out there, but hand washing, oral care protocol, VAP bundles, those are some of the top three things that are evidence-based, you know, prevention. <laughs> yes, Merrick. People don't realize that a lot of bacteria, they, it gets aspirated through microbes due to lack of oral care. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Thanks, Allie. Dr. James wants to know, is this still a problem today and necessary with the COVID problem? Absolutely. 
I mean, even though there are these protocols, um, it's still happening every day in abundance. So the best we can do as nurses is try to implement the prevention, you know, the protocol and do the best that we can, but it is still happening. Thanks, Mallory. We have one minute remaining if there's any other questions or comments. Lena said, do you think that there are any ways for nursing managers to ensure these protocols are followed? All they can do is reiterate, you know, proper training, Lena. Um, it's probably on um, the infection control nurse for the hospital to make sure things are being implemented. Um, I'm sure that they can't go every nurse to nurse to nurse, but they've got to put something in place to make sure that these things are being done to prevent HAP. And last question, do you feel like this topic will help you in your nursing career? Absolutely. I mean, we've been taught in, in school about it, but it's up to me as a nurse to implement it. Okay. Great job, Monica. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and move on to our third presenter. Next, we have Mallory DeRowan. Her judges, her participant ID number for your form is number 12. Mallory is presenting her work today that is entitled Palliative Care in Pediatrics. Mallory, you can begin when you're ready. My question was, how can nurses improve the quality of pediatric palliative care provided to their patient? Um, a lot of people don't really know what palliative care is, so I'm going to go over that. Palliative care is just um, comfort care. This does not mean that this is like the end of the road for someone. You can have palliative care while you're still getting treatment. Um, a lot of people get it confused with hospice. Um, but the main thing with palliative care is controlling symptoms and providing comfort measures like taking care of pain. Um, okay, so during my project, I kind of touched on three big topics. The first one was <clears throat> um, surveying nurses and how they felt prepared to go into uh, palliative care for pediatric patients. And they reported that having experience, um, more specifically experience in the ICU, helped them prepare to deal with what um, they would face. And also doing simulations. So having like a mock trial with um, different scenarios and giving them an opportunity to see how they would react and what needs to be said, what needs to not be said, you know, things of that nature. Um, so that was uh, really helpful in helping them prepare to go into that field. Um, the next topic that I touched on was how the families um, felt. And the most important thing that I found within these articles is that the parents want to have the last say so on like the treatment plan, whether or not they need to, which direction, you know, they want to go in. And, um, and I think that's like really important. Another thing that I found was that there's a lot of strain between um, the different providers. And if that happens, the parents pick up on that. And it's really important to have an open portal for everybody to be able to communicate. And whenever there's strain between professions, um, that just adds to the stress of the parents. And that just, you know, that hinders the care that everybody's going to give. And that just makes the whole thing more stressful. Um, and then the last topics that I had for um, my research, I... <coughs> I looked into how the nurses dealt with it because sometimes in these situations, you know, 
death is inevitable and it happens. And I wanted to see how these nurses were able to, you know, keep going because this is, it's, it's horrible when somebody loses their child. Um, and so the research stated that maintaining um, a level of professionalism and not communicating with the families like outside of um, anything to do with, you know, providing care was like really important. Another thing that was really important was um, being able to self-evaluate and know when you need to take some time away from, um, you know, th that setting. So being reflective and just knowing your boundaries and being like in tune with what you're feeling and stuff is super important if you're gonna go into that profession. Um, relevance to nursing, um, all of this provided really good information, um, really good insight to if somebody wants to go in this profession, like how to, what to expect. So I think that's how it's like relevant to nursing. Cause like I'm, I'm interested in that and I always wondered, okay, so how could I get into, you know, how do you start? And I think this was like a good, um, educational thing to help nurses that want to maybe take that route. Okay. Any questions? Dr. James wants to know why is research on this topic necessary? This is necessary because unfortunately this is some people's reality and not everybody, you know, it's not everybody has to deal with it, but some people do. And we need to know how to take care of these patients, what to, expect when we're going to be taking care of these patients and how to provide the best care, you know? So I think that's really important. Jennifer asks, what made you want to do this topic? And is this what you want to go into in your nursing career? Um, what made me choose this topic? I always thought that I would go into <clears throat> like palliative care or maybe something with hospice. Um, but I don't know. I, I just think, this is, it's a hard topic, obviously. Maybe I'll end up in palliative care, but I just feel like this needs to be like talked about more because this is a reality for a lot of people. Um, and it's just, it's hard. And I think we need to be more prepared for this. Um, Allie asked, how do you feel you would respond to death of children in this career? I'm not sure. I mean, I would love to say I would be able to you know, be as professional as I could and, you know, follow the line, but I'm not, I would hope that I would be able to be strong, but I mean, it's a sensitive topic, you know. Why is there a misconception between palliative care and hospice? And this will, I'm sorry, this will probably be our last question. Okay. I think there's a bunch of, um, negative stigmatism with hospice care and palliative care just because people don't people hear that and they think okay that's the end um so i would say palliative care is like the umbrella and hospice maybe falls under it hospice is more of um when every 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 treatment has like been stopped you know they're not seeking treatment anymore palliative care is, is just anybody can have that if you have like a long-standing disease heart disease lung disease you know things like that it's Comfort care. Thank you, Mallory. Great job. Yeah, thank you. Great topic. Thank you. All right. The next participant we have to present their work is going to be Alexander Aguilard. Judges, his participant ID for your form is number 13. Today, Alex will be presenting on his topic entitled Can Traumatic Brain Injuries Improve the Future? Can Imp let me start that over. Can traumatic brain injuries improve by further educating nurses? Alex, you can begin when you're ready. Hey guys, my name is Alexander Aguilar. Uh, so the question that I've researched, hang on, let me minimize this, is uh, do practicing nurses have the knowledge needed to promote the most optimal outcome in traumatic brain injury patients? This wasn't an accusatory question, it was more to propose how we can improve that. So my introduction, I'm gonna give a report on six articles related to the nursing care dealing with TBI. And the articles are gonna explore 
current nur nursing knowledge of TBI patients and ways that nurses can optimize and educate uh, with the work on these cases. I'm going to list each article. I'm going to give a summary of that article, then I'm going to give the implications at hand. So what is CBI, you might ask? Traumatic brain injury is a type of head injury usually resulting from a blow or a jolt to the cranium. Uh, these types of injuries can have a wide array of health issues, particularly dealing with the neurological system. Complications that can arise are neurological changes, range from mild altered state of consciousness to brain death. So it's pretty serious. Uh, you can have seizures, hemorrhage, fluid electrolyte balances, and a few complications that can occur as well. Uh, yeah, and right here, I just got a picture of them. It's kind of hard to make out the uh, words right here, but it's just a visual representation of the different kind of complications that can arise. So right here, uh, we're talking about rehab, as you can see in the picture. This was my first article. It'll, it was a study that delved into uh, TBI patients and rehab and what was the best way to approach these guys. And uh, it's just important that for each patient, we have an individualized uh, care plan. This is gonna help, first of all, with financial needs. It's gonna cut, reduce, cut the costs like significantly if we're focusing on what neurological deficits are taking place in this specific patient. Because like I said, it can range from anywhere from a mild state of consciousness all the way to death, you know. So it's important to know the patient's baseline of how their behaviors are. You can find that out from the family or from them. And we act after that, we, you know, we'll follow up with that. Uh, this article highlighted the necessity of treating with a high level of attention among caregivers because it can be something as slight as your pupils aren't dilating. That could be the change that we know. Uh, no two cases are alike, so it's important to note the subtle changes. Okay. Second article was the misconceptions about traumatic brain injury among nurses. So I really found this article interesting because it was talking specifically about nursing students. It was in India, but you know, a nursing student is a nursing student. So the article studied several groups. There's a questionnaire that uh, they were proposed and it showed that there was a high misconception on uh, bouncing back from a traumatic brain injury on the permanence of it. There was misconceptions just about brain damage and their recovery in general. Uh, the implications made by this author were that nursing students worldwide hold similar misconceptions that these uh, Indian nursing students held. And that's safe to say. I think the implications here are the students, you know, and if they have misconceptions in, in nursing school, there's a high probability that nursing students in the field have similar uh, misconceptions. So it's important that we educate on them. I'm gonna get to an article on that. So this is just a boxer. I took a picture, I, I like sports. So it's, uh, it's important to know that, you know, you can have traumatic brain injury from contact sports. But anyway, factors related to death in patients with traumatic brain injury. This article discusses the common epidemiological factors that relate in death. And as you might suspect, young adults, specifically males under the age of 40, are going to be more prone to TBI. Uh, also, motorcycle accidents, motorcycle riders in general, specifically those who don't wear helmets, are at an increased risk. It's noted, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Comorbidities that are often associated with death in the TBI patients are going to be hypotension, hypotensive shock is very important. That can be, that can happen from specifically hemorrhagic stroke, not stroke, but hemorrhagic. Uh, anyway, respiratory insufficiency is also another thing. And it is important to identify that these conditions in the early stages will optimize the chance of survival and recovery in the TBI patients. So you notice it quick, you treat it quick. That's how we're gonna optimize these guys, okay? The article identifies risks, risk factors of TBI in general, in the general population. It also discusses comorbidities that are often seen when death occurs in the TBI patient. It also highlights a demographic, so us as nurses can be advocative and uh, not necessarily subgroup these guys as gonna have TBI, but pay specific attention to the age group and the demographic that highlights a increased risk of TBI. So my next article was uh, discussing the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for hospital care and if increased adherence 
helps with the outcome. So there was an initiative at a specific hospital and they were funded. There was 16 hospitals and they were funded by the Adam Williams Initiative. They were funded to specifically adhere to the Brain Trauma Foundation. They uh, implemented a heavy charting system that you had to chart on stuff from infection prophylaxis, ventilation, vital signs, oxygenation, deep vein thrombosis pro prophylaxis, cerebral perfusion pressure, sedation, nutrition, anesthesia, prophylaxis, and the use of steroids. Uh, so it just showed that with increased adherence, there, with extra funding, increased adherence to these guidelines were like through the roof. So it just goes to show that uh, with attention, with money, with people actually caring about this topic, they have an increased adherence and a better outcome in the patient, uh, you know. Impact of an educational program on the nurse's knowledge and practice regarding care of traumatic brain injuries in the patient at Suez Canal University Hospital. So this was just a research study that was conducted that tested the knowledge of the nurse of the intensive care. Uh, they tested them before the educational program and then the hospital implemented an education just touching base again on a traumatic brain injury and they tested them again. It showed through the roof they were they had better scores after the educational program and then they tested them again a few months after and it just showed around the two three month mark uh, there was a decline in uh, there was a decline in just the knowledge so it's important that we reiterate this education education has to be thorough it has to continue to happen after nursing school nursing school is not the end of a nurse's education that's going to happen until we retire at seven years old you know and that's what this article is highlighting and my last article was again we're touching back on support something i really like and uh this was between the relationship between concussion knowledge and the high school athletes intention to report traumatic brain injury symptoms it was a systematic review of several literatures uh this article was just a comprehensive review of several studies on high school sport injuries that resulted in a concussion of the TBI, TBI, and if students were likely or not to report these types of injuries. Now with a high school student, they were concerned about what their peers and what their uh, teachers and stuff would say. And uh, it's a high school student, they don't have a whole lot of knowledge on TBI. So even though they might've heard about it one, one time, they got an injury, they don't want to sound, you know, like a baby or something because they report that they have head trauma or, uh, you know, just fuzziness in general. So it shows that seven out of 10 students would report it, but three out of 10 students would not report if they had symptoms of TBI following a sport injury. Uh, so this article's implications were just that the school nurse specifically, usually for a school nurse, you have one on duty for the whole entire school. So it's just very important that that student's well knowledge, that uh, nurse is well knowledge on TBI. They could teach the kids. She's watching out for the kids. She's assessing them. She's going to the sporting events and making sure that anyone with injuries is seen about, assessed properly. All these students have education. And this is just, you know, it's a big responsibility on the school nurse's uh, shoulders. But at the end of the day, we're nurses, we're advocates. We got to do that specifically for. Her. The high school student who's undereducated, you know. And here are my references. That's about it. So, do I have any questions? We'll have to, um, if needed, Alex, we may need to let them respond to, uh, let you respond to their questions a little bit later or through the chat. If we can just share maybe through the chat and he can respond that way so we can go ahead and move on to the next presenter, okay? okay. Thank you, Alex. Nice job. No problem. All right, our next presenter that we have is Hani Labrada. Judges, her participant ID is number 14. Hani is presenting her work on managing patients with heart failure. You're ready, Hani? You may begin. All right, so. Are you guys able to see that? All right, so I am presenting um, uh, how to manage patients with heart failure 
as you all know, um, patients with heart failure present different ways. Not everybody has the same signs and symptoms they have. Um, not everybody gets to this point because of the same reason. So you have to manage, uh, manage these patients um, according to uh, what they're experiencing. All right, so my introduction, I will be, uh, I will be presenting uh, different articles, six in total. And uh, I will tell you the nursing, um, nursing implications to, uh, of heart failure in this uh, article specifically. And I will also give you a little uh, definition of what the heart failure is, in case that uh, you're not aware of them, I'm sure all of you are. Okay, so heart failure is a condition in which the heart can pump, uh, can pump enough blood to meet the body's need. In some cases, the heart can fill with enough blood. In other cases, the heart can't pump blood to the rest of the body with enough force. All right, in this article, uh, I present, uh, the, the authors presented uh, how much, uh, how sleep is very important with these patients. These patients are usually uh, in a lot of pain, so it's very difficult for them to uh, have a good night of sleep. So it is very important for them to uh, take their medication as indicated, to take, uh, for example, they have uh, many of these patients are on, on diuretics. Uh, it's very important for them to take diuretics in the morning instead of at night, for them not to go to the bathroom uh, at night uh, on a regular basis so they can have a good time sleep, also to take their uh, pain medications so, you know, uh, before going to bed so, you know, they can have a good uh, night rest. My second article it is family caregivers experiencing of uh, experiences of caring patients with heart failure, a descriptive exploratory quality study. As you know, patients with heart failure, some of these, uh, these patients are not able to take care of themselves. So their family is very involved uh, with uh, helping them achieve uh, you know, their needs and helping them with their activities of daily living. Uh, it is very uh, strenuous activity for the family and for them to worry about these patients. So, you know, whenever we're talking, we're not only talking about patients, we're not only uh, trying to support patients, we're also trying to support their families because uh, they are uh, very involved in this patient's life and there is a lot of stress in, these, uh, in, in the family's lives. All right, my, uh, my next article, let me move this right here. Um, it is identification associated factors and prognosis of symptoms clusters. Uh, this was in uh, Taiwanese uh, patients. It was a study st uh, that was performed. Uh, this article recognizes the essence of identifying the underlying symptom clusters and the relationship with the management measures that have been incorporated to increase the likelihood of realizing positive patient outcomes. It is by defining the symptom clusters and their relationship limited negativities during hospitalization that the chances of mortality among heart failure patients can be addressed. The relevance of this, uh, of this article to the study question arises from the recognition that, uh, that symptoms clusters are uh, integral in uh, determining the measures for managing heart failure. This assertion is based on the understanding that all heart uh, failure patients cannot be managed through the single approach. So like I was saying before, these uh, patients have different symptoms. They have, uh, you know, and you have to manage them according to the symptoms that they're experiencing. Uh, in this article, uh, we talk about uh, learning needs. Uh, we all know in nursing school how important it is to teach and to teach uh, your, uh, your patients. So always uh, teach them what they can do to make, um, to make their lives better, how they can manage their symptoms, what to report to the doctor, and stuff, that, uh, and, you know, stuff like that. This article recognizes the essence of understanding the learning needs of patients with heart failure and the process of developing and implementing patient education program, uh, programs. There are different ways that you can do this. There are visuals. Um, you can uh, give them uh, you know, notes, uh, articles that they can read and they can get familiar with it. Also, you can pre uh, present them and like do a presentation so they can repeat it back to you. All right, my fifth article. Um, I love this article specifically because it teaches you to self-care. These patients, 
they had, they've had a hard life. Uh, they've had uh, many symptoms that, you know, that uh, affects their life. So it is good to self-care, you know, give yourself a hug, like, uh, like that picture shows, take a breath and uh, you'll be okay. You got this, you know, you can go through it. And this article uh, recognizes the instance of empowering and educating patients with heart failure to develop better ways of engaging in self-care, improving interventions that are directed towards the care among adult uh, uh, patients with heart failure increases the possibility that they will be empowered to prevent and detect exacerbations of their uh, conditions, improve symptoms management techniques, and the prevention of hospitalizations. That's what we're trying to prevent, hospitalization. We're trying to keep them safe and trying to uh, keep them health, uh, as healthy as we can. And the last one, this one's a very important. It is, uh, you talk, in, right here we're talking about management and prevention. Uh, so dietary habits, you know, just, don't go to McDonald's as much. Just try to uh, have uh, vegetable foods. Try to have a healthy diet. You know, you're not trying to uh, increase uh, the symptoms that you already have. You're not trying to uh, to have um, you know to have more symptoms or to make your condition worse. You're trying to get your condition better. So you know, live a healthy lifestyle and eat healthy foods. And in here, I just presented all my resources. Is there any questions? Connie, I'm gonna have you do the same as Alex and please just answer the questions in the chat as they come so that we can move on to the next presenter, okay? All right. Thank you, very good job. Thank you. Okay, for our final presenter for session one, we have Allie Laverne, judges, judge, Judges, her participant ID number is 37. So Allie has jumped to 37. Allie is presenting her work entitled Communication in Nursing. You may begin, Allie. Okay, so hi, my name's Allie. I did my um, presentation on communication. How does adequate communication affect the quality of care patients receive? No. Okay, so a variety of different studies were performed to demonstrate the effect adequate communication has on the quality of patient care. According to Ned Forrest, Berg, and Fagerstrom, effective communication be between nurses and physicians during hospital rounds could be a prerequisite for the quality, safety, and efficiency of patient care. Multiple quantitative and qualitative approaches were designed to view the influences communication has on a patient's well-being, handoff reports, and patient satisfaction. The overall aim of all six of these articles was to determine the influence communication has between staff and the use of bedside communication during the clinical setting. The results of these studies showed an Im improved perception of communication amongst the nurses as it relates to shift report and a reduction in length of handoff times. Nurses are encouraged to educate, hardwire, and audit communication at the bedside to improve overall patient care. These studies concluded that if there were professionalism, trust, respect, teamwork, shared information, and open-ended communication between nurses and physicians, there would be fewer misunderstandings, less frustration, less delays in patient care, and most importantly, the deliverance of safe, high quality patient care. The three types of supportive communication nurses portrayed included being emotionally present, showing reassurance through touch and or words, and coaching with encouragement. To have true effective communication, there has to be a two-way process, expressing and understanding in which messages are discussed until the information is clearly understood by both parties. Because effective communication is so important to patient care, learning different strategies for communicating with the vulnerable population should be very important to healthcare professionals. Um, strategies found by both or either groups or both groups receiving written information and preparing for the conversation. The conversation taking place in an environment without distractions and giving the client ample time to process and express themselves. This is my relevance to the nursing practice. Obvious communication is he uh, verbal and nonverbal. We as nurses are here to care for people at what may be the worst moments of their lives. Effective communication within the healthcare team is so important to the quality of care a patient receives. Um, negative factors can lead to a uh, misinterpretation of orders and goals, a nurse's inability to keep patient and family up to date with the plan of care, unclear patient goals, and failure to report important observations. 
These factors could all lead to unsafe patient care and a negative experience and or outcome for patients and their families. Positive communication skills can lead to a strong nurse patient rapport, which can improve overall patient care. Sometimes we get caught in situations where we do not quite know how to have effective communication with clients, whether it be related to a mental illness, a brain injury, or some other illness that has caused communication barriers. Being that effective communication is such a huge part of safe, safe quality patient care, I think when faced with these problems, research on different communication strategies is of great importance. Overall, if patients are able to effect, efficiently communicate with their healthcare team, this could give them options, improve their experience and quality of care, and improve overall well being. This is my pictures. Um, I have a picture of a nurse um, given report at the bedside. Um, I have a picture of the physician and the nurse talking. And um, this, this is the SBAR. Um, it's situation, background, assessment, and recommendations. And this is my references. Good job. Do you think um, this research has influenced the way that you'll communicate in your nursing career? Yes, definitely. I think communication is a big thing. Um, it's important to not only in, um, involve the patient in communication, but the family also. And it prevents um, like medication errors. Um, I mean, you educate the patient, stuff like that. Do you feel that proper communication is a problem nurses face often? Um, yeah, I do believe that. Um, I think sometimes nurses are so busy, they forget to communicate. They'll go in the room and just, you know, do their patient care and then walk out. And that leaves the patient and the family kind of lost at what their plan of care is and their status. So it's important to communicate, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, um, education. Okay. How would you suggest separating having a bad day from implementing positive communication and care for the nurse? Great question. Um, I think maybe just like stepping to the side and putting your work before everything else. You know, I mean, everybody has bad days, but that should not alter the way you care for your patients. Okay. And in your experience as a student, do you see appropriate communication being used in the clinical setting? Uh, for the most part, yes. But um, sometimes I do see them not like, I mean, they communicate to the patient, but they don't, you know, like include the family and really keep them up to date with like their status, like all times. I think every time you go into the room, you should, you know, either be teaching the patient or, you know, letting them know about their plan of care. But overall, yes, I do see good communication, especially at Rapids. How do I stop sharing? Okay, I'll go. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay, thank you, Allie. Very nice job. So this concludes session one of our presentation. So once again, um, I wanted to just extend a thank you to each of our presenters for sharing your work. I know you put a lot of work into this project and it really shows. So thank you for sharing that with us. I'm going to stop the recording for session one and then we will have session two at 1030 that starts in this same room. So you're welcome to stay in and um, or log back in at the end. Don't forget if you haven't signed in to Scholars Day to make sure you do that for attendance. Those students who are presenting in session two, if you'll just make sure that your PowerPoint is up and ready to go so we are ready for our next session. So we'll take about a 10 minute break and we'll see you back in here at 1030.